let's outline our terms. What is a tipping point and how is that different from a tipping element? So in this study, we use a definition of climate tipping point, and that's quite specific to try and clear up some of the confusion that's been out there in the literature and the media. So we focus on this aspect of self-sustaining change. So we say that a climate tipping point occurs when in part of the climate system, so that's something like an ice sheet, an ocean current, a rainforest, when change in that system becomes self-sustaining beyond some warming threshold, and that's normally the result of some sort of positive amplifying feedback process kind of leading to a runaway change in that system. Uh, and the tipping element is the part of the climate system the tipping point happens in. So the element is, for example, something like the Greenland ice sheet, and the tipping point is the threshold beyond which the Greenland ice sheet will collapse without uh, being able to come back to its previous state. David, why do you think the science of tipping points is rising to top of agenda here? I think it's because there's been so much science that's happened over the last 15 years since it was first introduced in this 2008 paper that Tim did. Back then, it was kind of it was a thing that could potentially happen at some of the higher temperature levels. So a lot of the tipping elements they identify there uh, happen in the sort of three to five degrees above the level of warming in the 90s. So it sort of felt like kind of a far off possibility. But in the 15 years since then, climate science has only really kind of brought those thresholds down and added new potential tipping elements as well. And now that it's coming to the point of being in the some of those tipping elements are now uh, possible to be triggered now, even at today's level of warming, and we can see that warming is going to get to at least 1.5 degrees in the coming decades. It's all becoming too close to home for comfort. When the Arctic sea ice suddenly shrunk in 2007, scientists in the field were blown away. Was that a tipping point seen in the rear view mirror? So in this study, we don't talk about Arctic summer sea ice as being a tipping point, which is probably something that might be a bit controversial amongst some listeners, uh, because that's traditionally been one of the sort of classic tipping points that people have talked about, or the stuff to do with the albedo positive feedback loop. It was a really good example. But in this study, we don't actually include summer sea ice as a tipping element, uh, and that's because in the literature since 2008, we just couldn't identify a particular threshold beyond which the change in the Arctic sea ice became self-perpetuating. So there was a big low in 2007 and some big lows since then in the Arctic summer sea ice. But in general, it's somewhat rebounded afterwards and it, it's following a logistic curve downwards. Picking up on when you say it follows a logistic curve downward because the public perceives global warming and its impacts as rising a bit every year and, and every decade. But are more sudden changes of state possible? Yes, exactly. And, uh, for example, with Arctic winter sea ice, from various different model into comparisons, we can see that there is actually the possibility for abrupt uh, changes in Arctic winter sea ice as a result of this sort of self-sustaining change that comes out in the model. That happens at a higher level of warming than Arctic summer sea ice. But certainly there are parts of the uh, system where we do see these more abrupt uh, shifts driven by these uh, tipping dynamics. Whereas we think Arctic summer sea ice is definitely being reinforced by positive feedbacks, but there are some negative feedbacks in that system as well, which are keeping it on a relatively kind of steady, predictable logistic curve downwards. This reminds me, though, a few years ago I interviewed a scientist from Rice University, uh, Pankaj Kanna, that was his name. Uh, their team literally found broad steps of coral under the sea off Texas in the Gulf of Mexico. So for coral to die all at one level like that suggests the sea rose rather quickly in steps several times faster than the coral could adapt. So you've talked about in your paper something called the Labrador convection. What is that and what does it tell us about the way tipping elements can unfold? So the Labrador convection collapse that we talk about in the paper, it's a new element that we've introduced and it's been branched off by from something called the AMOC, the Atlantic Original or the Turning Circulation. They have relatively similar drivers in that both of them are to do with where water flowing up the, the warm water flowing along the surface of the Atlantic flowing northwards, and then they sink both in the Labrador and Erminger Seas in the north and northwest Atlantic, and then also off the northeast Atlantic as well, off of Greenland and Iceland. And both of those can be disrupted both by warming and also from meltwater flowing off Greenland as a result of that warming as well. And that changes the density of the water it's sinking and it disrupts it. It makes it harder for it to sink. And at some point, it just switches off, uh, both for the Labrador convection but also the AMOC as well. 
But the interesting thing we're finding in this study looking at the literature is that the Labrador and Omega C convection can actually turn off a lot sooner than the rest of the AMOC, and it still has quite a big impact. It's not quite as big as the rest of the AMOC, but it still causes a huge amount of um, cooling around the North Atlantic region. It can disrupt uh, weather patterns across Europe and North America, and it also can disrupt the monsoons in the tropics as well, in particular in West Africa. And perhaps most interesting is for some listeners is that it could add something like a foot to sea level along the eastern seaboard of the U.S. and Canada uh, because it changes where some of that warm water is sloshing around in the North Atlantic. So it could go, sea levels could jump up a bit around those regions in only a decade or two. But if I understood your paper correctly, you find that the Labrador tipping element and a related collapse of AMOC, as you discuss, could cool the Earth a bit. So not all tipping points lead to global warming? That's right, although it's worth noting that it's a temporary global cooling as well. It temporarily changes where heat is distributed around the planet. It changes where the radiators, uh, some of the forcing uh, is located. And it does lead to a global cooling in some of these studies. But it is a temporary thing, uh, whereas some of the other things, like obviously releasing lots of carbon uh, from permafrost, that carbon is going to stay in the atmosphere for thousands of years. So that's kind of a much longer-term concern. But yes, you could sort of see the AMOC and Labrador current as being kind of a temporary bonus that counteracts some global warming. But actually it causes a huge amount of weather disruption and chaos as well. Uh, So it's definitely not something that we would uh, want to be experiencing. And as you expand in this paper, not all tipping points are global. Tell us why regional impact tipping elements do matter. Yeah, so we made this distinction in the paper. Uh, For example, if we're looking at something like the the Greenland ice sheet collapse, that's a really big part of the Earth's system that pretty much goes in one big go, and it affects everywhere around the world. That would add something like seven meters of sea level rise over thousands of years and cause some amount of global warming. So that's kind of obviously a global thing. Whereas some things like the loss of coral reefs, that's much more kind of each coral reef has its own uh, localized tipping point or similar with uh, mountain glaciers as well. They're not obviously connected as one big unit that goes together. But what we're looking at is that a lot of these systems go at a similar level. So both with the um, coral reefs and the mountain glaciers, they go around about 1.5 degrees in our assessment or 2 degrees for the mountain glaciers. And we're saying that the tipping in those systems might be localized to each glacier, to each coral reef, but they happen fairly synchronously across large areas of the world at a similar uh, warming level. And also those systems have a massive impact on humanity, apart from the obvious thing of coral reefs and glaciers being kind of, it'll be tragic to lose them in in themselves, they're of great value. Uh, Millions of people also depend on them, so coral reefs support uh, hundreds of millions of people through fisheries, through coastal protection. Mountain glaciers provide drinking water to millions of people, hundreds of millions of people as well. So even though they're kind of not giant global units that sort of go in one fell swoop, they still happen over similar time and affect millions of people. And that's why we designate them as regional impact tipping elements so that they're still considered as part of that list. Our recent guest, Michelle Dvorak, explained why her team concluded Earth will cross the 1.5 degree danger line before 2030. The UK Met Office suggests we may have one year at 1.5 in the next few years. In your new paper, when you talk about regional tipping points that could arrive with 1.5 degrees of warming, three are changes in the boreal forest. That is the vast band of trees circling the Arctic. What are the tipping elements there? So the tipping elements in the boreal forest, there's, in particular, there's the southern dieback, which is where there's, especially along the transition between boreal forest and steppe grasslands, uh, you can get these um, fire feedback. So in particular around those regions, they're warming, they're drying out. That means what there are forest fires in the southern boreal forest, there's now much more likely uh, to be the case that the forest will be replaced by steppe grasslands rather than regenerating as boreal forest. I mean, on the northern edge, we have um, the actual expansion of boreal forest into what is currently tundra. And that matters because it's, uh, a lot of the tundra is, has permafrost underneath it. And so the expansion of boreal forest, which is darker colored trees that has uh, a different albedo which means that actually it causes extra local warming it boosts warming in those northern regions and helps 
warm up the permafrost underneath faster and the Arctic Ocean faster as well. We have those as becoming possible relatively soon, but the point at which they become likely we actually have is a bit higher up, kind of in the beyond three degrees sort of range. Uh, but that doesn't actually take account of things like deforestation as well, and there, there have a, there's a certain amount of uncertainty and low confidence on those ones. But it's certainly starting to kick in as well. And also in those regions, there's obviously permafrost, and especially the abrupt permafrost fall is the one that's becoming already possible now and likely beyond 1.5 degrees. And that's where you get all these erosional features like further past lakes and uh, slope slumps and stuff like that that help to boost uh, greenhouse gas emissions and also really disrupt the landscape, uh, destroying infrastructure like roads and houses and disrupting uh, livelihoods in that part of the world. New science finds the Arctic has already warmed four times faster than the rest of the planet. The Arctic is well past 1.5 degrees warmer than pre-industrial. Does that mean key tipping points may have already been crossed there? So in our study, all of the thresholds we give are with respect to global temperature, the global mean surface temperature. And so do take account of the regional differences in warming as well, including that extra Arctic amplification. So we're, we're not saying that we've crossed any tipping points for sure right now, but we are saying that they are possible at current levels of warming, even if warming were to stabilize right now if emissions stopped right now, which of course is unlikely. Uh, we're saying that five uh, tipping points are already possible and become several of those become likely to be on 1.5 degrees. So even accounting for that Arctic amplification within our global figures, it's, we're, we're still you know, far too close to comfort, and we are, of course, heading towards 1.5 degrees pretty quickly. Are tipping points reversible? Mostly not. In our definition, we're focusing on self-sustaining change. Some previous definitions specify either being abrupt or irreversible, or both abrupt and irreversible. We're saying that they are often abrupt or irreversible. Uh, but not necessarily. There are some special cases where you could actually, at least mathematically, you can define a system that has some level of self-perpetuating, self-sustaining change beyond the threshold, but actually it could be reversible. And it's to do with this idea of um, hysteresis and viability, whether or not you can get a system existing in two different states at the same, effectively, in this case, temperature level. Uh, that's not always theoretically the case here. But pretty much most of the things we're talking about are going to be irreversible changes, like the Greenland ice sheet. You can collapse that, uh, and then at the same temperature, even if you've got temperature levels back down to pre-industrial, you wouldn't regrow the Greenland ice sheet unless you actually went below pre-industrial levels. And that's a really good example of uh, history to some viability that you, know, you can't just easily reverse these things. You actually have to push far in the other direction to get a full recovery. Check out the Radio EcoShock website. We're at ecoshock.org. You are tuned to Radio EcoShock. I'm Alex Smith. Our guest is David McKay. He is a UK geoscientist and lead author of a startling new assessment about tipping points closing in on us as we heat the planet. David, a key chart in your new research article shows global core tipping elements. What qualifies as that? So this is where we're looking at large areas of the planet that are covered by a particular system like an ice sheet of ocean current or a rainforest. So it covers a large area. I think in the paper we define it as at least one million square kilometers. There's a tipping dynamic, that, a tipping process, which causes all of that to go in a relatively uh, single process. Uh, and then also there has to be a certain level of global impact as well. So we're talking of at least 0.1 degree added to global warming as an impact of that. And then that will obviously affect a huge amount of people, and in particular, it affects the whole state of the Earth system. So we talk uh, about the Greenland ice sheet a lot. If we were to lose the Greenland ice sheet, the and a lot of the upper um, cryosphere elements around the Arctic, this would cease to be a bipolar ice planet, a ice, ice house planet. Uh, we've been a, in a bipolar ice house state since the last several million years. That kind of a particular state of the Earth system that we're in. And if we were to lose the Greenland ice sheet and various other uh, ice elements around that region, we would cease to be a bipolar ice house planet, would be a unipolar ice house planet. That sounds like a sort of, you know, sort of, you know quite a science textbook sort of definition, but it has really significant consequences for the planet. It would literally be a different planet.
Seven out of the ten global scale tipping elements you look at warm the world even more. I wonder, are these warming numbers cumulative? For example, if the collapse of the boreal permafrost happens and the Amazon rainforest dies off, do we add each number to whatever warming humans create by that time? To an extent, yes, but there's some complications here in that these elements are actually interconnected to each other. And while most of them are, make other tipping elements more likely, some of them are actually make other tipping elements less likely. So, for example, the collapse of the Labrador Convection uh, in the North Atlantic uh, actually can protect the Greenland ice sheet to some extent because it causes regional cooling. And there are other examples like that. So it is technically you could add up all those numbers together to arrive at some big final number. But in order to get a proper grip on this, you'd actually have to do some more complicated modeling where you feed all the different interrelationships between these tipping elements together and work out you know, if one goes, does it make the next one more likely at a particular temperature level? How much temperature does that add? You'd have to sort of crunch the numbers in a more detailed way. Uh, and that's actually something we're doing some follow-up modeling on using a, a simple model uh, ourselves. And in general, yes, there, there is going to be some degree of amplification by these tipping elements, uh, these tipping points being passed. But they do have some interesting uh, interactions between them, which we don't really cover in this paper. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Does your study take into account the possible domino effect that Tim Lenton and his co-authors considered in 2008, how these tipping elements uh, react with one another? So, no, not directly. All of the numbers in this paper are looking at the studies that focus on each of these elements on themselves. So they're, they're all individually assessed. So when, there's a fresh, when threshold numbers are given, that's just from the amount of warming necessary to trigger that element on its own. Obviously, the interactions are really important and could change some of these thresholds as well. But it was already a really, it was already a really big study as it was. So that that was sort of subject to some follow-up work. And I know that I'm working with some colleagues who are trying to work out some of the details of doing this interaction modeling to try and figure this out in more detail. And just this year, eminent scientists like Michael Mann and Kevin Trenberth suggest Earth will stabilize at whatever temperature exists when humans stop emitting more greenhouse gases. They find the vast Pacific Ocean would mop up any continuing sources of heat, presumably even from the unfolding tipping points your group studied. But your work seems to point to continuing warming due to natural systems. Uh, what do you think, David McKay? So in general, I tend to, um, especially if, if emissions were to stop now, the balance of evidence is, is that there would be relatively little extra warming. Uh, there was a thing called the Zero Emission Commitment Comparison Project where they looked at this and found that overall models, as they found now, suggest that emissions stopping now would mean that there'd be warming would roughly stabilize. Some of them got a bit colder, some of them got a bit warmer. I think there's, there's definitely a possibility of looking at that some of the models are perhaps underestimating uh, some of the... We're seeing quite a lot of tropical carbon sink decline at the moment. That's possibly underrepresented in the models. So I think in order... A precautionary approach would be to assume that maybe there would be, you know, it would tend towards being a bit positive, there may be a bit more warming that would come after hitting zero emission commitment. But I don't think this paper... It doesn't directly undermine that sort of conclusion. It, there might be a bit extra locked in, but a lot of these things like the the warming from uh, Arctic sea ice decline or green and ice sheet collapse, things like that, some of these numbers are already included in the sort of IPCC warming projections. So they're not necessarily things you can directly add on top of what is already being projected. Um, but I definitely think that in order to be on the safe side, we just should assume that there might be a little bit of extra warming in the pipeline, and that means that you know, we really should cut carbon down as soon as possible. Well, this new article in the journal Science continues more than a decade of study into tipping points, as we've talked about, and we can find that work at the Potsdam Institute, the Stockholm Resilience Center, University of Exeter's Global Systems Institute. David McKay, what brought you into this work? So I've been interested in the linkage between climate and the biosphere for quite a while. So I started doing PhD um, back in 2011, 2011 to 2015 at the University of Southampton. And I was studying paleoclimate change, so ancient climate changes, in particular looking at some periods of really uh, intense climate change over the past 65 million years. Uh, and I was interested in how the, some of the longer-term feedbacks 
uh, work between the climate and the biosphere and also the ocean as well. I was working a lot with modelling of uh, ocean and plankton and how carbon cycles between them. But that brought me more, I got more interested obviously in the current day and the sort of the possibilities of feedbacks now. And also from period climate change, we can see that there are these periods of more abrupt change. You don't always see kind of gradual changes over time. Sometimes you see big steps, big step shifts. So that got me interested in the idea of tipping points and also the idea that you might be able to use statistics on data to try and see if you can get early warnings, early warning signals before these shifts happen. So I did a bit of work on, well, can we pick up some of these early warning signals uh, from records before uh, these ancient climate shifts. And so when I moved to Stockholm Resilience Centre to do a postdoc with Johan Rockström, I was interested in kind of uh, applying some of these ideas to the current day. So I've been looking at the, the biological pump in the ocean and how that might be affected by uh, climate change. So the idea that you know, plankton in the surface ocean, they export carbon from the surface, but they might not export quite as much in response to warming and all, all the ecological complexities of trying to figure out exactly how that might change. So that's how I got into this area and yeah, definitely you can see these feedbacks and tipping points being a big thing in the past so it's interesting to try and work out well what does that mean for us now. And this paper about triggering multiple climate tipping points got more mainstream press coverage than usual for science papers but that will fade, we know that. We need a mechanism for such big scientific news and warnings to reach national leaders and investors and, and management and big corporations. Tell us about the University of Exeter Tipping Points Conference you just attended in September. Yeah, so last week I was down in Exeter and we were talking about both these sort of what we were telling as negative uh, climate tipping points. We're looking at climate tipping risks and also the possibility of kind of social ecological system um, cascades and breakdown and things like that. But we were also looking at the idea of uh, whether positive societal tipping points can be triggered. The idea being that we're currently on a path to something like 2.6 degrees at least of warming on current policies rather than the 1.5 degrees that would minimise uh, climate tipping risks. And that's a huge gap to close. So maybe what we need is to trigger some sort of positive social economic tipping points that are like triggering social movements as an example of um, social change or economic, you know, something to do with technological changes that might help accelerate some of the uh, transformations we need. So that was something we were talking about. And part of this is it was proposed that there should be annual reports. So there might be one this year before the COP27 UN climate talks in Egypt. And the idea is that, well, the Global Systems Institute together with the Potsdam Institute might put together kind of a yearly annual report to kind of give the world an update on what the climate tipping point risks are, but also on what the potential kind of like the leverage and intervention points to trigger positive uh, socioeconomic tipping points might be and keeping track on all those things looking for early warning signal signs for destabilization, but also potential opportunities as well. I'm really glad people are talking about this. We need to. Michelle Dvorak also told our listeners, even when humans get to net zero, warming will continue a bit, but only for a decade or so. She calls it overshoot. Looking at your upcoming work, are you able to discuss your coming work on overshoot and the tipping points we just talked about today? Yes, yeah, so there's, there's a preprint where a colleague of mine is looking at this idea of overshoots and climate kind of tipping points. I can't talk about that too much because it's uh, under submission rules of the journal. But the idea is, yes, what is what happens if we overshoot some of these climate kind of tipping point thresholds but then try and make a step back? What if we go over 1.5 degrees, you know, maybe go up to something like you know, 1.8 or even 2, and then bring things back down to 1.5 or below over time? Does that lock in some of the tipping point risks, or can we try and actually, you know, can this minimise the risks somehow? Uh, in particular, for some of the slower tipping.